Hi, I'm Tony. I'm an author, presenter at Sky Sports, and years ago I went to the jungle and got ill. Very <laughs> ill. So this is my podcast adventure to find more energy. It's packed with biohacking, science, health tech, supplements, and some of the most well-known experts on the planet. This is something I spent four months of my life doing with electrodes glued to my head so that you can do a lifetime worth of meditation. Decide what you don't give a fuck about, which is something you don't care about. Some of it gets quite out there. I had some stem cells sent up to my house that I had stored, and then I injected myself with mannitol. And we even hack hangovers. Alcohol is poisonous. So is water and oxygen in the wrong dosage. So that's my podcast, Zestology. Live life with energy, vitality, and motivation. Today on Zestology, how to work without losing your mind. I think that's kind of important at the start of January when we're all back at work. And some of us don't really want to be there. Now, Kate Zavia is the author of How to Work Without Losing Your Mind, a realistic guide to the hell of modern work. And that's what we're focusing on today on this podcast. Now, I'm Tony. I hope your day is going well. I'm walking along a fairly unglamorous road in West London. But as you know, it is my vow and pledge to um, walk the walk and do things that the themes that come up again and again on Zestology for kind of re-energizing and revitalizing and recharging and one of those is getting out to do loads of exercise it can be tough sometimes when you're stuck in a in a room or in my case the shed at the bottom of the garden working all day especially in January when there's not been much sun today and the weather hasn't been very nice so I'm very grateful that I made that decision to come out and about to record these podcasts because here I am doing a little bit of exercise and getting my step count up Now, if you don't really get what leaning in means and you have no interest in hustling or slaying to be a badass boss, I think you'll like this podcast. One of Kate's best tips is all about making a boring list, which I really like and I think is one of the best parts of this podcast. What does making a boring list actually mean? I will let her explain. By the end of this book, by the end of this podcast you will be making a boring list too. There's also a great story in the podcast about Kate's partner. Kate met her husband on MySpace. Remember that? Yeah, not Facebook or Instagram, but MySpace. Um, She met her partner on MySpace and she's basically fallen in love with her partner on MySpace and they've been together ever since. So it's a great podcast. It's really nice to speak to Kate and here she is on Zestology. Right, now look, I've been very excited about your book. I've been having a look at it. I've been kind of stalking it a little bit on Amazon. And I think the <laughs> the description of the book is something that's very much whetted my appetite. I'm a bit of a kind of a, a book description geek, actually. And I think right. it's very well written and it's a very kind of tantalising. I want to know more. So tell, tell us and, and me and everybody listening about the book, what it's all about. I suppose the category is business, but it, it seems to yeah. me that it would really appeal to everybody. Yeah, it's um it is a business book, but I don't I don't know of many business books that have um poop emojis in it and uh curse quite as much uh as I do. Yeah. Um but yeah, basically so the book is called How to Work Without Losing Your Mind. Um and on the cover it kind of encapsulates it quite nicely with the, with the little circle I have on there saying survive the manager from hell, avoid burnout, ditch comparison culture. And those are kind of like the three main points of the book. But overall, it's all about kind of navigating the really difficult situations that come up at work and really kind of focusing on the things that you can control, the things that are not in your control and being able to kind of own you know, what am I bringing to the party here that's making things at work difficult? And then also being able to acknowledge, you know, what what isn't about you. Um, and also there's a fair bit about kind of how do we look after our mental health at work? How do we look after our energy? You know, how do we address overworking and burnout and what causes those things to happen? Not just having a, a toxic working environment or a micromanager boss, but, you know, what you, if you're overworking yourself, there's something that you're kind of getting out of it it's it's speaking to some part of you and so it's kind of figuring 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 out what that that part of you is that um is kind of fueling your need to overwork so yeah yeah, it covers a lot (laughs) 
So I, I'm, it's I'm not presuming. A short book. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, no, I can see it's over 300 pages. It is. Um, it's, um, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because this book was presumably commissioned before the great pandemic of 2020, which now yes. that this is going out in 2021, will never be talked about again. But, um, but actually, a lot more of us have thought a lot more deeply about our working conditions over the last year, where in the past, we might have just got on with it a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I came up with the kind of when I first started pitching uh, the book, and that was you know back in February 2018 um, when I first kind of had the kind of bare bones idea of it. And yeah, it definitely I think unfortunately, unfortunately has become probably even more relevant because I think as you said, uh, this past year 2020 has really caused so many people to reevaluate their relationship with work and the way that they're working and the impact that that has on their lives in a way that you might not have done before because it was so separate perhaps from from your quote unquote real life and now those things are much more integrated whether we uh, like it or not and whether we've been lucky enough to be able to uh, work from home during everything that's been going on this year yeah well I'm looking forward to getting into some of the, the nitty gritty of the things that we actually do but I think one of the interesting things about this podcast is that often it's quite a good excuse to provide a bit of self-evaluation of kind of how much am I practicing what I preach I don't really preach but you know I mean the people yeah there are, there are consistent themes that come on around energy and I tend to try and follow them and then sometimes I'll spend kind of 10 hours in the shed doing some work hunched over a laptop I won't have even been outside and I'll think hang on this isn't actually <laughs> what <laughs> what I should be doing yeah. did you find that something similar happened at, at times you were kind of writing about something and you thought I've actually got to take that advice now well, do you know what? what's funny is that at the time when writing it, I was um, kind of recovering from two really difficult work situations. So it felt different when I was writing it. But just as I finished it last January now, um, I was about to go into some contract work and I was going to be in an office for the first time in a year yeah. for, you know, three to four days a week. And so that felt very challenging to be like, oh my God, I've just written this thing and my my future colleagues are going to know about this book. And I'm going to have to really watch myself <laughs> to make sure yeah. that I'm trying my best to kind of adhere to, to what I know to be true and do have kind of as you said preached about in this book and then even you know now in the process of promoting it and um, launching my own podcast and everything I've had to really kind of check myself because it, it is an evolving thing right we don't just suddenly realize like oh yeah I need to do this thing I need to look after myself mental health isn't just like a a box ticked is it it's a no. monotonous long journey <laughs> that you keep having to reevaluate and uh, kind of readjust things so yeah it's been a very good tool to keep myself in check absolutely great yeah now you've I know from your biography and from having done a little bit of research that you worked at uh, big places including Google uh, yeah. where your days consisted of uh, aggressive bosses complimentary pasties and uh, pastries for uh, pastries not, not, I think not they had Cornish pasties, pasties. Too, so. <laughs> <laughs> they probably had both <laughs> I mean it all sounds good that bit sounds good the lots of tears bit doesn't sound so good no. so I mean you know to a lot of us Google sounds like the dream place to work so what did you learn from your time at Google which has found its way into your book yeah I mean it there are so I mean to be clear there are so many positive things about working there I think that so you, you have to I say that because there's was... people from Google listening to this now <laughs> Come on, get no, to the negative I genuinely, bits. <laughs> I genuinely mean it. Like, I really did want to be able to stay there. And I think I just got really unlucky with the situation that I found myself in um, when I was there. Um, I think it, it, it helped me kind of lose the notion of a dream job because I had such high expectations for what it would be like to work there. And then particularly to be hired there, like, I, I was headhunted to to join the team that I eventually ended up joining. Um, it was wonderful for the ego to be able to say that and to uh, to be there because they drill into you how hard it is to get a job there. And, uh, you know, it's something like, you know, you have more likelihood of getting into Harvard than you do of getting accepted at Google or something like that. Mm. And it... it the things that made it difficult for me really had nothing to do with the company as as a whole and everything to do with 
um, the team structure that I was working in and uh, the kind of things that the people I was working for triggered in my own kind of psychology. So it was a really bad combination of uh, my my own, the things that I struggle with at work, uh, particularly relationally with, with management and authority figures. And then, you know, the team just kind of was not set up for someone of, of my expertise or level of expertise uh, when it came to editorial. So it was just like a really bad mix. Yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> of, not very good um, with authority figures at work or outside work, really. Either. I don't really like being told what to do, especially if I don't agree with it. That's that's an issue for me. Yeah, I agree. For me, it's more so what I do is I go, you're the authority figure and therefore I will do what you say and I will listen to you and I will try to figure out a way to please you and to make you think that I'm very good at my job. And uh, if I start to see cracks in that person's, and this isn't even particular to Google, but if like if I'm working for somebody and I can see that I could do a better job than them it with management or even what their job is, I'm like, Mm, I don't really think that this is going to work. And then it gets really complicated. Yeah, really yeah, fast. Yeah. So, so how do we kind of um, progress without burning out? How do we have a healthy, non-toxic relationship with our boss? Yeah. I mean, that question of how do we progress in our careers without consistently burning out? Like selfishly, that was the kind of driving question that that really fuels the whole book and fueled my uh, my own want of writing it. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get a very clear answer. <laughs> I was hoping that I would I would interview like a couple of people and they'd be like, "Let me tell you the secret." Here it is, kid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that didn't really quite happen. But what did end up happening is that I was able to kind of take things from my own experiences and of those that I interviewed for the book and kind of go, "Okay, this is." This is this is a, an approach that we can all take to, you know, working without <laughs> losing our minds. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it is boring, to be honest. <laughs> it's a lot of it is really boring stuff, and it's uncomfortable stuff, and it's it's things like you know, if you're having a hard time with your manager, as as you brought up, it's you know, well, why? Like what? It, like what is going on here? What what behaviors are they? Um, uh, exhibiting that are triggering for me and are upsetting me and and why do I think that is and you know analyzing you know have I asked for what I want or have I just assumed that they mm. that they know what I want um, in this role um, for my own progression and a lot of times it is a frustration that your manager should just know yeah. <laughs> they should know this thing about me. They should just be better at this. Why are they so bad? And it's really easy just to kind of brush somebody off and be like, oh, well, they're just, you know, bad at their job. They should know this. Why do I have to tell them this? Why Why do I even have to ask for this stuff, you know? Mm. But you do. You do have to have uncomfortable conversations. You do have to explicitly ask for what it is that you need in order to do your job well and, and effectively. And then, you know, when it comes to not burning out, it's all it's all connected. It's, you know, managing these uh, relational issues that can come up um, at the workplace, being able to distinguish, you know, what's your stuff and what's their stuff and then deciding kind of what you do about that once once you actually realize it and, you know, being able to kind of monitor and maintain your own mental health, um, you know, just in life, because I, it's, it's, I think it's easier to kind of approach taking care of yourself better when it's not when you don't think about it as this is work and this is my real life if you right. kind of yeah. try to integrate those two things a bit better it, i think it you start to kind of view the different areas of your life and how you can um better manage your energy yeah you know kind of based on what, what it is that you're actually kind of hoping to get out of everything so That's it's interesting. I mean, I, i've never really i suppose you could say i've never really had a proper job but um but i mean you could call presenting a proper job or not really but um it but is, it's, the, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's a proper job oh it is yeah but but it's um but it's certainly not proper hours or normal hours i mean for instance yeah. last night i you know i left work at half past midnight which is what one of the harder. negative shift work is hard man yeah, it's it is. really hard yeah and and not only that you know i mean at 10 to midnight I'm still having to make a lot of sense because if I don't, you know, um, I'm going to make a fool of myself on live TV kind of thing. Yeah. Um, the the upside of all that is that 
I never do an eight hour day. And in fact, this afternoon, Kate, you're the first of four podcast interviews that I'm doing, which is pretty much the most wow. that I'll ever schedule in a day. And that That's seems a like a that seems like a heavy day of work to me. I, yeah, I, it is. I don't know how people do eight hour days. I think a kind of a four or five hour day is much more healthy. What do you think of that? I think that's my template for world success for everybody. <laughs> do you know what? So, I mean, but the thing is, is that you could be in an office job that you actually didn't have to work that hard in. So you could be there for from, you know, eight to five or whatever. And maybe, yeah, you have to be there, but maybe you're not working as hard as you would if you're doing you know, four interviews in a row, which is a lot. Like, I think it, it all has to, I think it has so much less to do with um, environment and uh, kind of the official structure of, of work and more so like your energy and what you put into it. Because, you know, doing recording stuff is, is hard. I think from the outside looking at people don't realize that it, how um, taxing that can be. But it, I think actually more people are now from being on Zoom all day. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, yes, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's exhausting, isn't it? You know, I mean, it's weird because working from so home weird. or being a digital nomad has always been the dream. But actually, you're staring at you're staring at a screen all day and um, you're not looking into the eyes of unpredictable, exciting people, are you? No, it's it's really strange. And I think um, I what I hope doesn't happen is I don't want oh, this past year to put people off either working from home more permanently, working for themselves. Because, you know, if you've never done it before and then you kind of got thrust into the situation of working suddenly remotely um, when you don't have childcare um, and your partner is also working from home, if you're lucky enough to both have kept your jobs, um, that's not what working for yourself is necessarily like. And that's not necessarily what working remotely or, or even being freelance is like either. They're very different things but and you know without the kind of options of okay and now I'm going to go to this cafe for lunch and take a break or you know I'm going to go to my friend's house later you know without those kind of normal uh relaxation and recreational things that we do to balance out the kind of intensive screen work that we're doing it's it's really hard yeah it's really um uniquely difficult this year yeah it is um, I, I wondered if I could run you past the kind of rules that I've got to be productive and do the right amount of work and kind of enjoy it at the same time. And I'd like to yeah. know your opinion on them because this is at the top of my to-do list then. And that the first thing is that this concept of thinking as bandwidth. And I think I feel like I've got, you know, mm. I don't want to be too extreme like Steve Jobs and wear the same T-shirt every morning because I don't want to think about what different one to wear. But essentially, there's only, I've only got a certain amount of thought capacity during the day. So I really need to protect it. Yes, like absolutely. No, I yeah. like that a lot. Yeah. And it because it is, I think, um, especially with like writing, so much of what you end up writing down, particularly if you're writing fiction is is happening in your head. You're mm. doing a lot of processing, you're doing a lot of working out of, um, you know, plots or what you want to say or this, that and the other. And it, it is it is really taxing. So yeah, you do have to account for um, yeah. your thinking time. It's important. And too much of it is exhausting. <laughs> I do a lot of writing as well. I've got a side question for you, which might not be interesting to many other people, but it is to me. Um, how, When you're writing, how many hours mm. a day can you actually write for and do all that processing that you were talking about and get a good job done before you have to switch and do something else? Mm, I think... I really kind of subscribe to Elizabeth Gilbert's um, kind of school of thought on this, where she says, you know, there's no point in sitting down, strapping yourself down to your your, your laptop or your desk at 8 a.m. and then being like, oh, I have to sit here for eight hours. Yeah. And you figure out when your creative times are. And there are times, particularly when you're on a deadline or you have edits to do, where you do just have to sit down and, and flip and do it, you know. But if you're in the writing process, um, I honestly probably three, I would say max yeah. three hours, maybe yeah. four. And those aren't even necessarily consistently. A lot of it is the kind of structural kind of planning. Um, it depends on what you're writing as well, but doing nonfiction, a lot of it was like, you know, picking what I wanted from interviews and transcribing those interviews. Yeah. And then once that was ready, I could then go okay, now I piece this all together and I would have to pick, you know, the sort of best times of day for me that I knew I could actually do that. Um, yeah. And getting those kind of conditions right 
that <laughs> nice pun that then let you write <laughs> because i mean you're you're making a series of important decisions that you know this is yeah. your this is your pride and joy this book and constantly you're having to make big decisions about where to put what and that is that is that bandwidth isn't it and that leads on to the next bit of of the at the top of my to-do list which is do the most important thing first <laughs> which is mm. I mean it's probably something that you know a lot of people say it's still quite hard for me to do to sit down at nine o'clock and not just want to kind of crack on with procrastinate with a bit you of email it. first or something like that <laughs> or just I don't know check the check the sports pages you know yeah no absolutely it's um <laughs> so it's, I mean you see all these memes around that on on like Instagram where it's like the thing that has been causing you the most anxiety and you've been procrastinating on for about four yeah, months yeah. ends up taking you probably 15 minutes max yeah, <laughs> and it was yeah. never even that hard so true. I think um yeah absolutely kind of getting getting the the big kind of scary thing that you need done that day kind of out the way first does allow you to kind of concentrate better and kind of get all the other easier bits done yeah no, that yeah. makes sense for sure whether or not we always do it well <laughs> even when we know better well. yeah interrupting today's zestology to talk about immunity for one moment there's never a bad time to boost your immune system but let's be honest at the moment times are pretty tough aren't they life is a bit meh and we do need to boost our immune system I don't need to tell you how important a strong immune system is right now, given the global health crisis that's going on. And probiotics, for me, are a key part of the puzzle. It's probably the first, I think it's probably the first supplement that I ever took. Before I was into all this stuff, I started taking probiotics. And over the course of about two weeks, I noticed an enormous difference. And now I take P3OM probiotics, which is today's Zestology podcast partner. They improve your digestion, that's good, and help you absorb more nutrients. But they also help ensure your digestive tract and immune system are working the way that they should be, staying strong and healthy. Some probiotics don't kind of survive the stomach acid, don't survive as they go through uh, the digestive system, but P3OM is fully tested to make sure the probiotic strains not only survive in your body, but don't compete with each other as well. And uh, you don't need to refrigerate P3OM as well. So if you are ready to boost your immune system this January, it's kind of, I feel like this January, this is what we need to be doing. Have healthier digestion, burn the fat as well. Go to bioptimizers.com slash Zestology. There's a deal on there for you. Bioptimizers.com slash Zestology. You can use the promo code Zestology10 wherever you are in the world. If you're in the UK, you can use that code as well. It's just go to bioptimizers.co.uk rather than .com. Use the code Zestology10. A couple of things to remember. Bioptimizers.com slash Zestology and promo code Zestology10. I feel there's never been a more important time to boost your immune system than today. Back to the show. The, the other couple of rules that I've got is, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure this is something that you would probably subscribe to. I mean, like the self-care aspect of meditating and working out for me, but whatever it might be for, for whoever it is. Um, and also having a kind of, I find, having, because I know that you've worked in some, obviously you've worked in places like Google. I know that you worked for BuzzFeed and mm. Microsoft as well. So you've worked in these big, intense, dynamic workplaces where there's a lot going on and you've got to hold your own you've got to be sharp all the time and I always find this it's not something that I've really ever articulated before but I think a kind of a healthy um disrespect for how much it all means can be quite helpful you know it's not brain surgery I really oh, like absolutely. working in tv and I love talking about sport but it's sport it's not saving lives yeah. you know yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. And I write about this in the book. You? Yeah. When you hear, this is urgent, this is yeah. business critical, this is an emergency yeah. over and over again. It's like, oh, come on. We are not like, depending on, I mean, anywhere that I've worked, it's like, really? This video about a car, mm. is that important? Or, oh, really? This description yeah. of this piece of art is business critical? <laughs> like this yeah. stuff, yeah. This stuff where it's just like, you need, you absolutely need that perspective. And I think that so few people actually in the, the bigger companies have it. You know, it's like, come on, let's get some perspective here. And like, I know that billions of dollars go into these companies. And, you know, but certainly in the teams that I've worked on, I'm like, 
guys, let's let's get some perspective here. It's yeah. not. It's as you said, it's not brain surgery. And I think the best bosses I've ever had, the really good ones, are able to juggle the kind of the corporate needs with the fact that they're actually just really great people, and they and they treat yeah. you just kind of totally in a non corporate way. Absolutely, I think the best people that I've worked for, unfortunately, there hasn't been a heck of a lot, yeah. but like, even like the team that I'm working with um, at Penguin. So my, my team is Penguin Business, my publisher. And you know what, actually, and this isn't just, you know, saying this because they're telling me to, like genuinely that this, that has been one of the best working experiences I've had. And I, and even though it's part of a really, really big company, um, everyone that on the small, you know, penguin business team that I've been working with has just been, you know, they have perspective and humanity and they, um, they, you know, treat you like a person. And if you have something in your personal life come up or something changes or whatever, you know, they, they treat you as such. Um, yeah, I think having that empathy is, is huge. Absolutely right. huge. Yeah. It's, isn't it funny how different organizations have different cultures and it just wildly yes. varies so much? <laughs> yes, it really yeah. does. It really, and it really comes down to the team you're working with and, and who your manager is. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, Kate, I've got to ask you about a line in your on your Amazon page for your book. <laughs> um, it says, Kate was born in California and moved to London age 20 to marry a British man she met on MySpace. What, <laughs> <laughs> what exactly happened there? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> um, I know it'd be so much of an easier story when, when people go, oh, how did you two meet if we just went on holiday a long time ago? I was yeah. on a gap year. <laughs> but um, yeah, genuinely, I was living in California, working at Starbucks and was just on MySpace looking at cute guys that lived in the UK. I don't know. I was an Anglophile. I, I, don't, wow. I probably still am. And I found um, this guy called Ian and we put up the same... Um, Oh, like survey that you used to be able to add to your yeah. MySpace yeah. profile. We had the same one and we liked the same kind of pizza and he was really cute. And so like I messaged him and was like, oh my God, hi. Um, and he ignored me for about a week because he thought I was spam. And to be honest, if some random Californian yeah. like, messages you about pizza, you probably go, mm, not quite sure about this. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we, we, we struck up a, a friendship and uh, that escalated very quickly. And I had already had uh, tickets booked to come visit a friend that was that was going to school here. And so by the time that I actually showed up, we were kind of basically already in love without actually having met each other. Oh, so goodness. yeah, it's very romantic and a very like romantic um, greeting on the platform at Houston Station. Um, and yeah, and we got married a year later and I but I moved over here I think about four months after we, after we first met in and person yeah it yeah. sounds bonkers no, like it's fantastic <laughs> and here you are 15 years later yeah yeah we've, we've been together for 15 years yeah as I time know. goes on you'll have to explain to people what MySpace was when you tell the story <laughs> yeah. just so old it was only it was like barely cool I think when we met on it so yeah. it's always just a bit um it's been a bit <laughs> retro <laughs> that's that's really great though wow you're certainly yeah. someone with the courage of your convictions i mean when it comes to the big stuff yeah i struggle with what to have for lunch most days but if it's a yeah. big life-changing decision i'm usually pretty good about it yeah and here you are you could be in california but you're in london so there you i are. am yeah. yeah yeah with all the beautiful weather <laughs> oh, that is that is brilliant now um kate obviously the questions that i ask everybody in this podcast is what is one book that you would recommend and one tip for living with more energy and vitality um the book can be anything could be a fiction book or non-fiction anything that's had an impact on you or you think that people might enjoy reading oh goodness i mean I struggle with this question so much. I got asked this last week and I like full on panicked because I was like, oh, I don't know. Yeah, you don't need um, to panic. I really, <laughs> I really, I, I think it depends on the situation. I think um, as we are talking about, about work, um, I would ob absolutely recommend um, Viv Groskup's book, um, How to Own the Room. I think that, because it's all about public speaking, but she has so much wisdom in there just about kind of how to approach how to approach your work. So I recommend that to people a lot. Um, but as I said, there are so many books where I feel like I always just like want to like prescribe people like a drug where I'm like, oh, read this one. Oh, have you tried Untamed yeah. by Glennon Doyle? Oh, what about, I mean, 
big magic i haven't even read i've like read snippets of it and like listened to article like um interviews with elizabeth gilbert and yeah i still people tell people to read it so i don't know um big magic what is what is this magic i mean i haven't read it either um, it's all about a creative living without fear and it's where a lot of her um input on uh you know confronting fear and being creative at the same time and finding the best days of uh, best hours of your day to work and that sort of thing. She had a podcast with, I listened to a whole bunch of the podcasts and I bought the book and the book has barely been cracked, cracked open, but yet I still recommend it to people. Yeah. That's uh, I've just looked it up. It looks very good. I think you're yeah. in over 300 episodes. You're the first person to recommend a book you haven't read, but that's, that's excellent. I that's mean, very good. honestly, it, but that's more honest, isn't it? Because yeah, it I swear is. people probably do that all the time. It's like the links we share on social. We've not clicked on it and read it fully, but Hey, we think people should, read that article from the Atlantic yeah exactly yeah now what about one tip then for living with energy and vitality and obviously we've spoken quite a bit about kind of living an energized work life Uh, what what would Mm -hmm. what would it come down to if you had to pick one make a boring list make a list of all the things that if you that you know that you need to do on a daily weekly basis to look after yourself mine is very basic it's like wash your face have you how much cheese have you eaten today like if you're yeah. feeling bad like this is like the list of stuff to go down like how much screen time have you done have you done yoga today have you meditated today how much water have you drank it's just a very boring list but my god it really really helps oh that's great i mean i was going to name this podcast after your book but maybe we should call it make a boring list you know <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yes. a good one. just make a boring mental health list make it, a boring list yeah yeah it's yeah. um simple but effective that's very good very good well look um huge good luck with the book we're going to make sure that this comes out in the week of the book's release oh thank um, you so would you just uh, obviously it's on amazon everywhere else but just remind people of what it's called and, and where they can find it Absolutely. Yeah. So the book is called How to Work Without Losing Your Mind, um, published by Penguin Business. It's out on the 14th of January and you can find it at every good bookshop, including WH Smith. Um, and it's also out on ebook and audiobook if that's your thing. Yeah, it's great. And um, yeah, having looked at it on Amazon, as I say, I love the description. It's very well written. Oh, it's thank you. Very, thank you. Um, it's tantalizing. <laughs> Makes me want to know more. So uh, Wonderful. I look forward to reading it. Kate, good luck with it. Thank you so much for coming on Zestology as well. Oh, thanks very much, Tony. That is pretty much it for this week's Zestology. Thank you for listening, as always. A quick shout out to my podcast partner, P3OM Probiotics hardcore probiotics that are going to do you so much good i'll tell you what p3om will do for you it'll give you more energy less bloating more mental clarity and shift your metabolism into fat burning mode so as if this podcast wasn't already all about energy you've had a few too many mince pies over christmas and now i'm offering you a shift into fat burning mode (laughs) doesn't get better than that does it So P3OM uh, probiotics, brilliant for boosting the immune system, having a healthier digestion, getting things really working in the gut. I know from personal experience how many problems I used to have with my gut and how probiotics were probably the first thing I ever tried that's starting to help. And um, as I say, there's no podcast partner on this podcast that I don't try out myself, but also use myself. And um, that makes it quite a lot of fun to have podcast partners, actually, including P3OM. So if you want to try out P3OM, you can get a discount with Zestology. If you're in the UK, you can head to bioptimizers.co.uk and use the code Zestology10. That's bioptimizers.co.uk and use the code Zestology10. And if you're anywhere else in the world, you can uh, just head to bioptimizers.com forward slash Zestology. All the info is there. Bioptimizers.com forward slash Zestology. All the information there on P3OM. There's all the various kind of discounts as well. Um, as I say, the UK have a separate site, but um, anywhere else in the world, uh, bioptimizers.com forward slash Zestology. Mental clarity is something that's like so important for me and such a big theme on this podcast and energy as well. And I think in the context of what I've been talking about in Kate, that sounds pretty good. Feeling a little, just a little bit clearer in the mind as you sit down to work, even if your job is a little bit hellish. 
Right, thank you so much for listening to Zestology. I'm going to tell you who's coming up in the next couple of weeks of podcasts because next week we're looking all at the commando mindset with a man who used to be a commando and has trained a lot of famous people that you would know. So it's, hopefully that's a little bit of a tease. If you fancy getting a commando mindset, as you know, one of the things that I love to do on this podcast is kind of do the biohacky stuff and look at supplements. And the other thing, especially in January, is I like to look at mindset and motivation and how we're going to make it a great year. And then the week after, um, we're going to sleep school because... Um, I have been having some weird dreams recently, so I've enlisted the help of a man who knows how to interpret them, and I think you're going to enjoy that one as well. They're coming in the next couple of weeks. Until then, have a good one. Still uh, challenging times, isn't it? But um, I hope you're getting on okay. I really do. Um, If you'd like to get my newsletter with the the things that I've been doing to re-energise and all the latest hacks and tweaks that I've been investigating, uh, you can go to TonyWrighton.com, and I'll see you next week.